might sound crazy now, but uh, stepping into a human freezer. The reason people struggle with having a New Year's resolution and sticking to it is because it's a tactic. So many of us want to make a fresh start. Well, let's talk about some of the trends when it comes to your natural health. The biggest skin trend right now, why is everybody washing their face? Well, there is certainly no shortage of these strange and unusual ways that people are trying to look and feel their best. The keto diet is simply a shift in how you eat. What do I need to adjust? What do I need to change? A good resolution that you can actually implement is to try to figure out some way that tomorrow you can conduct your life in a slightly more honest and useful manner than you manage today. Like our Pensacola campus is probably colder up there than it is here, but on a cold, rainy day, is there anything like an ethos potential church cup of coffee? Ah, it's good to the last drop. All right. Hey, if you want to pull out that uh, outline, it's on our app, or if you want a paper copy, you can probably get one in the lobby. I want to mention again real quick, you know, as we go into this new year, We've been talking about fasting, which is going without, kind of con allowing God the opportunity to tell us what needs to be serviced, if you think about like an automobile in our lives, you know, what needs to be shifted in one direction or the other. And then um, Wednesday night is an opportunity to have Bible study. It went really well. Thank you for all you uh, incredible folks who came out on Wednesday night as we walk through the book of Second, um, Second Timothy. So excited about that. Now, oh, and I forgot to mention something last weekend, and I apologize. And, you know, we kind of getting ready for 2019, and we're fasting, and we're studying God's Word on Wednesday. And the other thing we did is to write some devotionals each day. So you can start your day, or if you're not sure kind of where to go, it's got a scripture, a thought, a few questions, and I'm putting those every day on my Instagram. So uh, it's at Troy Gramling if you want to check those out. Now this whole series is based upon the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. Now, 1 Timothy is when Paul's in prison for the first time. And look at what he says. Remember, Timothy's pastoring the church at Ephesus. It's a great opportunity, but it's a really difficult city in which to do ministry. It's a big city, a port city, uh, diverse people from all over the, the world with a lot of philosophical ideas, a, a lot of false gods. And so Paul writes Timothy and he's like, hey, Young pastor, because look what he says. He says, don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Timothy is probably somewhere between 38 and 42 when uh, Paul wrote this. He says, but if you want to be successful, here's what you do. So you and I can take those same things and apply them to our life. He says, if you want to be successful, first of all, we talked about this last week, be an example to all believers, first of all, in what you say. And remember last week we talked about if we're going to do life, we got to do life with other people, and therefore we need to be able to communicate. And if you didn't have, weren't here, I encourage you to check that out. This week, I want us to look at what's he say next. Be an example of all believers in what you say and in the way you live. Now, remember, originally this text is written in Greek. And here's what that phrase literally means. To conduct oneself with focus on overt daily behavior. So really what Paul's saying, he's saying you need to be an example in your behavior. Or you and I could say it like this your habits. So what behaviors or habits do you and I need to experience in our lives to actually succeed in 2019? Because that's my heart's desire. The whole reason for this series is that you and I aren't sitting here next year talking about what we're going to do the next year because nothing changed this year. And, and I don't want that to be for me either. Now here's what we all got to know going into this. That's what it will be for most people. Most people live their whole life with very little change or progress in the right direction, in the direction of their dreams, in the directions of their destiny, in the directions of their purpose. And one of the reasons, I wrote this in my journal, is that progress is often on the other side of pain. You ever notice that? If you want to make progress in life, you usually have to walk through the pain. If you look in, on your app, I put it like this. Success in 2019 depend, demands that we be comfortably uncomfortable. 
comfortably uncomfortable. Now, here, here's what I mean, is that we have to be comfortable knowing there's progress in our uncomfortability. Knowing that the difficulty I'm experiencing, the pain I'm experiencing, is actually going to lead to success. So I am comfortable in this uncomfortability. I, uh, right, we, we learned this early. I remember when I was in sixth grade, I had a growth spurt. I grew a lot in, I'm 6'4", so I grew a lot in uh, L, uh, sixth grade and, and 10th grade. And I remember my, my legs, right under my knees, really bothered me. And so my mom took me to the doctor. And I don't know if this is true, if you're in the medical profession or not, but the doctor said it was growing pains. And I, I don't know if we have physical growing pains when we have a growth spurt, but I do know that growth is always preceded by some kind of pain. I, I learned that when I went and started playing basketball. Our coach would tell us, hey, get on the line. And here's what that meant. We're going to run. Running is uncomfortable. I mean, maybe some of us like running, but that's just the weird people that are here today, okay? I mean, it's just uncomfortable. And I, he'd get on the line. We'd run a line drill, you know, to the baseline and back, free throw line and back, half court and back, free throw line and back. And then he'd say, do it again. Had to do it in less, I think, in 21 or 23 seconds. And it, it just, it was just completely uncomfortable. But I learned to become comfortable in that uncomfortableness because it led to progress. It led to success. It led to opportunities. We were able to do, I was able to, to do in ball games things I wouldn't have been able to do had I not been willing to go through the pain. The same thing is true when it comes to patience. If you're going to become a patient person, you have to go through the pain of frustration. Frustration, you know, when you're frustrated, that's painful, that's uncomfortable. And what I really want to challenge us to do this weekend is to become comfortable in the uncomfortable circumstances of life. And again, Jesus is our example. It's not in your outline, but up on the screen, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Look at what it says. Because of the joy awaiting him. Who is him? Jesus. He what? Endured the cross. And the cross is what? Uncomfortable. So why in the world did Jesus go to the cross? Because of what it would produce. What was on the other side? He was willing to be comfortable in that uncomfortableness because he knew what was on the other side. And that's the challenge. As I talked on last Wednesday, we have to be willing to remain under in order to be able to actually succeed in 2019. And it's a choice. Nobody's going to make any of us remain under. Now, what do we call that? What is the ability to be comfortably uncomfortable called? It's called self-control, right? Because the skin's always pulling towards the ditch. And the ability to say, I'm uncomfortable, and my skin wants to do what? Get comfortable. I mean, right? It's easy to get comfortable. The moment you sit down, what do you do? Do you think, man, let me get as uncomfortable as I can so that I can focus? No, man, you want to get comfortable. Why do we have theater seats instead of benches? Because they're more comfortable, right? And so it takes self-control, or you and I might call it a different word, discipline. S say that with me. <laughs> it's not quite that sad of a word. All right, let's say, it. let's say it one more time. Discipline. Look at what the Scripture says in Proverbs, which is the wisdom writer, and he, it tells us what happens if we don't have discipline or self-control in our lives. It says a person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. Some translations say it's like a house without windows or doors. What is, it, what is the text saying? It's saying if you and I do not have discipline or self-control, we're open to all kinds of attack. We're open to our desire. In other words, we're going to follow our desire into destructiveness. It happens all the time. People spend more money than they have, and they end up in debt. Why? Because of no self-control, no discipline. And as a result, that brings about destruction. People have affairs on people that they love, they have children with, and yet they have an affair. Why? Because of lack of self-control or a lack of discipline. People fail classes that they have an intellect that they could pass. Why? Because of lack of self-control. Control. So it is impossible to succeed in the behaviors or the habits that we need to have in our lives in 2019 without self-control. Now, a few moments ago, I gave you a marshmallow. How many of you got that marshmallow? How many of you have already eaten 
that marshmallow. In the 1960s and 70s, they did what was known as the marshmallow test. They took some children, they put them in a room, and they gave them one marshmallow. And they said, if you wait until I come back and you don't eat it, I'll give you another one so you will have two. Now, we don't have any video from that original test, but they have redone that test a few times, and we have this video. So let's watch it together. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one. So then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you I'd give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> yeah, all right, so I've got some giant marshmallow. Who hasn't eaten their marshmallow? All right, there you go. Who hasn't eaten their marshmallow over there? All right. Anybody over here? There you go. There. How about over here? All right. There we go. Now, here's the interesting thing about that study. They followed not those children, but the original children as they grew up. And those who had self-control ended up getting more education, better jobs, and making more money than those who ate the marshmallow. Now, that's interesting because it actually proves what the Scripture tells us, is that self-discipline, self-control is important in the ability to have an experience and live out the habits that actually lead to success. One of my favorite, or I won't say favorite, i say motivational text, is found, this is Paul again, and he's writing to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look at what he says. He says, we all know that when there's a race, all runners bolt for the finish line. But only one takes the prize. When you run, run for the prize. Now, what is it you're running for? When he says, when you run, he's talking about when you live life. When you go to college, when you go to work, whatever it is that you're doing, when you run, when you live, he says, run to win, run for the prize. How? Verse 25. Athletes in training are very strict with themselves, exercising self-control over what? Their desires. In other words, athletes are willing to be comfortably uncomfortable. And for what? For a wreath that soon withers or is crushed or simply forgotten? That's not our race. We run for a crown that we will wear for eternity. So I don't run aimlessly. I don't let my eyes drift from the finish line. When I box, I don't throw punches out into the air. I, and there's that word, what is it? I, what? Uh, I know it's a hard word to say, but one more time. What is it? I discipline my body. I self-control my body and make it a slave so that after all this, after I have brought the gospel to others, I will still be qualified to win the prize. So without discipline, that word that maybe none of us like, the self-control. Without it, we will never add to our lives the habits. We'll never shift, you might say, to the habits that we need in order to succeed. But with it, this year could be totally different. And what I want to do is I want to look at some of the habits that Paul 
was talking about when he told Timothy, remember, be an example in how you live. And so we'll walk through these pretty quick, but uh, there are five of them. Here's the first habit or behavior that we need to shift to if we're going to succeed in 2019. The first one is, first habit is we have to invest, not spend, because spend's just a transaction, but we have to invest time with God. Look what the scripture says in Joshua, which is an Old Testament book, so it must have been in Timothy's mind. He says, study, some translations say meditate upon this book of instruction continually. What book's he talking about? He's talking about the scripture. Meditate on it day and night so that you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you, what? And, oh, now these, we can say these happy. These are good words. This is not discipline, all right? Let, let's, let's say it again. Then you will, what? And how many of you in 2019 want to prosper and succeed, right? In your finances, in your marriage, in your college education, in your business, whatever it is. He says, in order for that to happen, you're going to have to hang with God. You're going to have to spend time getting to know him through his word. He says, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord God is with you wherever you go. Now, when I, we talk about um, investing time with God, we're talking about prayer, which is just talking with God and listening, not so much for, you know, a voice from the heavens, but for God to speak to your heart, to tap you on the shoulder, to get quiet. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. We're talking about hanging out in his word. And again, it's not how long, it's how consistent. It's like any relationship. You, I can spend a day with Stephanie a year, or I can spend a shorter period of time with her every day. Which one is going to develop a more intimate relationship? It is that consistency. So we're talking about prayer. We're talking about hanging out in his word. I would encourage you to journal. Um, it, it limit yourself because then you start feeling guilty. Do I need to write 10 pages? Or, you know, I limit myself to a page. But here's the reason I journal. is so that I can look back and see what God's done in my life. Because when I face the next challenge, it's so easy to forget that God was faithful in the past. Right? Because all I can see is what's in front of me. And it's big. And it's overwhelming. And it's a struggle. And, and all those things. So I would encourage you from time to time to journal. You know, we talked earlier about fasting and Bible study. Those are um, practices, habits, in order to get, to get to know God. And it's an investment of time to pray, to read his word, to journal to fast, to, to be a part of Bible study. That's why Wednesday night is all for us to be able to dive into God's word. See, we're looking at these scriptures, and they're true. But what we're trying to do on Wednesday is give a broader context of what's happening in the world when these things were written. And so online, if you're at one of our campuses, or you can come here live at Cooper City. How many of you are morning people? How many of you would say you're a morning person? How many of you would say you're an evening person? Now, it's, what's interesting in the Scripture is how often it encourages us to spend this time with God at the beginning of our day. Look what it says in Psalm 5. O oh Lord, hear me as I pray. Pay attention to my groaning. Listen to my cry for help, my King and my God. For I pray no, to no one but you. And then verse 3. Listen to my voice in what? The morning, Lord, each morning I bring my request to you and wait with expectancy. And the thing that I've discovered in my life is that there are times, man, when you're reading the Bible or you're praying, and it just seems so real. I mean, it's so easy to pray because you just feel so intimate with God. And every time you pick up the Scripture, it's like it's speaking right to you. And then there are other times that every time you try to pray, your mind wonders. Every time you try to pick up the scripture, it just doesn't seem to make sense. And in those moments, what do you have to do if you're going to invest time with God? You're going to have to be comfortable in your uncomfortableness. Sometimes it's easy to be here and worship and be a part of Wednesday. And man, you just, it's exciting. And there are other times when, man, you'd rather do anything than come. You're tired. And you know, if you come, you're going to have to engage with people and they're going to talk to you and you just want to be alone. And, and so the question is, in 2019, are we willing to be comfortable in this uncomfortableness, knowing we're not comfortable with the uncomfortableness. It's in our uncomfortableness. We're comfortable knowing it's leading to progress. 
It's leading to the other side. And it's the only path in which growth happens. And it's all every time that you move out from underneath, every time that you're uncomfortable, you search out being comfortable, what are you doing? You're stunning your growth. That's how we all end up in 2020 in the same place we are in 2019. A little older, but financially we're in the same struggle, same stress, same difficulty in our relationships. This is going to be the year, we say, again and again and again. Why? Because we all search for comfort. And until we are willing through discipline to say, I'm going to be comfortable in this uncomfortableness because I know it's taking me somewhere. Now watch how these build on each other. So the first habit is I'm going to invest, not spend, but invest time with God. Secondly, I'm going to invest, not spend. I'm going to invest time in rest. Can I get an amen? Rest is a little more fun, isn't it? Right? Look what the scripture says in Psalm 127. It says, unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects the city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late night, anxiously working for food to eat. For God gives rest to his loved ones. Now, if we invest time in, with God, getting to know him, becoming intimate, what happens? We learn to trust him. Why is it that we struggle to rest? Well, what is that scripture actually saying? It's saying our tendency is to do what? To think it's all upon us. If I'm going to feed my family, then I've got to make that happen. If I'm going to protect my family, then I've got to make that happen. And what is the writer of Psalms saying? He's saying, basically, you can have the best security system in the world, but without God, it really can't protect you. You can make all the money in the world, but that, you're going to just stay up worrying about it. Afraid somebody's going to take it. Only when you and I come to the point in our lives where we're intimate enough with God that we can actually trust him with that so that we can rest. See, you can't rest if you're worried about losing everything you worked for. You can't rest if you're worried somebody's going to take from you what you've earned. I, I remember when our oldest son, Tyler, was born. He was born like five or six weeks early. And, uh, and, and so, you know, lots of stuff go along, a whole story there. But remember when we got home. And, you know, I, I was the, the worried one. Stephanie wasn't a worrier. I was a worrier. I was like, is he breathing? So I'd go into his room. He'd be asleep. And I'd like, you know, lean down. I'd wake him up accidentally trying to determine whether he's alive. And he would scream and Stephanie would get mad. And then he would go back to sleep. And then I would go in and wake him up. And he would scream and Stephanie would get mad. And I remember, I, I still to this day remember, I was sitting there on the bed. And I realized that Tyler wasn't getting any rest as an infant. Stephanie wasn't getting any rest. I wasn't getting any rest. And we weren't making any progress. And I remember sitting there and deciding, God is either God or he's not. He can either take care of Tyler. It doesn't matter, you know, how old he is. God can either do it or he can't. And I've got to trust him. In other words, I've got to go to sleep and put it in his hands. And you know what happens when you do that? You are able to rest. And the same is true with whether or not you're afraid somebody's going to break into the house or whether or not somebody's going to ruin your company or whatever it is. What the scripture is saying, these habits build on one another. When we become intimate with God so that we can trust him with our business, with our kids, with our future, with our finances. I mean, God modeled rest. Remember, what did he do on the Sabbath? He rested. Even Jesus, look what it says in Mark chapter 6, verse 30. It says, the apostles returned to Jesus uh, after their ministry tour, and they told him all the things they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and what? Rest. Let's rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. Now, do you think whoever was first in line to see Jesus when Jesus put up the uh, break sign got angry at him? Well, Jesus, I've been in line for two hours, and now you're going to go take a break? But he went and he rested. You know, the problem sometimes with rest is that we're, it always makes somebody else ang somebody angry. Somebody else has got, always got something for you to do, right? And it's that relational fear that sometimes causes us to overwork. Because I got to thinking, why is it that we don't rest? 
Because it really does take discipline to go to bed. Why do we stay up so late? Knowing that how late we stay up is going to affect how much energy we have tomorrow. And how much energy we have tomorrow is going to determine how much success I have. So we intentionally fail. Why is it? And, and I just try to few things down. One is, like I said earlier, it's just stress. We can't sleep. Why? Because we're worried about our job. We're worried about our business. We're worried about a relationship. We're worried about all these things. And rather than turn them over to God, we turn them over in our mind. Over and over. And we can't sleep. Sometimes it's because we hate the morning, isn't it? And I don't mean we don't want to get up. I mean we hate our life. Because if you stay up, the moment you go to sleep, you're going to, right, you don't know when you're sleeping. Right in the middle of your sleep, you don't say, okay, I got three hours left. All of a sudden, you just wake up and it's morning, and that means what? You got to go to school and you hate school. You got to go to work and you hate your work. Hate your life. And so you stay up as late as possible. Why? Because you love Netflix. <laughs> All right, popcorn, Coke, Netflix. And you know, the moment you go to sleep, the next day is going to be here and it's just miserable. And so we stay up late. And here's the problem with that. We, we don't have these habits for success in our lives, and so we don't make any progress. Some people hate their life all their life. They live for the weekend their whole life. They stay up as late as possible because they hate their job. They hate the people that they do their job with. It doesn't have to be that way. But we have to have discipline. We have to have self-control to say, I'm going to hang with God so that I can trust God so that I can actually invest in rest. And I'm going to be comfortably uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for me to go to bed knowing that in the morning I'm going to have to go to a job that I do not like. But I know that the discipline to go to bed, to have energy to go to the job I don't like is eventually going to lead to the job I do like. I do love. Right? It, and that's called simply discipline. So we invest time with God, we invest in rest, and then here's thirdly, we live, this is not investment, we live generously. And when I say that, I'm talking about all areas of our lives. I'm talking about our resources, I'm talking about our time, I'm talking about our skills. Now watch how these all build, these habits all build on one another. Ecclesiastes 5, the wisdom writer, the Old Testament. So this had to be rolling around in Timothy's mind. Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. The more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. Amen? Some of you are like, I'd just like to see that happen in my life. All right. So what good is wealth? Except perhaps to watch it slip through your fingers. People who work hard sleep well, whether they eat little or much. But the rich seldom get a good night's sleep. Why? Well, because they're worried about their boat. Right? They're wondering if their water's going to freeze on their mountain home. They're worried about their, their business and whether or not the employees are going to open up on time. Now, that doesn't mean that those things are bad or those things are wrong. Here's what that means. Is that if we don't employ these habits in our lives, we are not positioned in order to experience success. See, if you are investing time with God and becoming intimate with God, Getting to know him so that you can trust him. You're getting the kind of rest that you need because you're able to trust God with that boat or whatever it is, that business. Then you're able to actually enjoy the blessing that he brings. You know why some of us have never experienced the blessing, the destiny that's in our heart? It's because you're not prepared for it. It would destroy you. Does lot, have you <laughs> noticed how many people get destroyed by success? God loves you too much to allow that to happen. And so if we truly do want 2019 to be that year of breakthrough, then we have to have the discipline to employ these habits into our lives. What is our excuse for not being generous with our time, or our money, our skills? Don't we say things like this? If I had more time, I'd volunteer. I think what you're doing is good. I'm just busy. If I had more money... I'd give it. I'd help the poor. Can't tell you the number of times uh, folks have told me, you know what, Troy, if I win the lottery, we're going to start a bunch of campuses. Uh, Troy, if I get this business deal through, we're going to build a parking garage over there on that property we just got. I, we all tend to be that way. I'm just so busy. And if I had more, well, this is a scripture that jumped out at me. All right. Look what it says in Luke 21. And we're going to look at it in the context of not just money, but 
time and skill, all these areas of our lives. It says, while Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts into the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow is given more than the rest. And they're like, what? <laughs> she didn't. No, no, he explains it. Verse 4, for they have given a tiny part of their, what's that word? They're surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. So here's what I wrote in my journal. According to Jesus, generosity is not expressed out of our surplus. In other words, what you and I are asking for, if we received it, it wouldn't be generous then to act upon it. In other words, if you had more time, and it was that more time that allowed you to give, that wouldn't be generosity. If you're unemployed and you're serving in some capacity, that's a good thing, but it's not a generous thing. If you're an incredibly wealthy person and you're giving some of your money to help other people, that's a good thing. It's just not a generous thing. And so when I read this, it kind of hit me between, is it a lot of times I'm asking for something that wouldn't allow me to live this. In other words, generosity is not determined by, how, by my surplus, by having more. You say, so Troy, what you're telling me is that as busy as I am, God wants me to serve. Yes. You say, well, how in the world am I going to do that? Well, you say, so Troy, what you're telling me is I've got this financial weight and stress, and you still want me to give. You want me to be a generous person. Yes. Well, how in the world is that going to happen? Well, all I can tell you is look at what the Scripture says. Proverbs eleven twenty four 24 says, give freely and become what? More wealthy. So evidently, when it comes to time and skills and resources and money, God has a different way of doing things. Be stingy and what? Lose everything. The generous will what? Prosper. And then look when it thinks about time. Those who refresh others will themselves be what? Refreshed. Interesting. So if we want to succeed in 2019, we've got to invest some time getting to know God. I don't mean getting to know about him. I mean getting to know him, hanging out with him. And at times that's going to be uncomfortable because you've got places to go, you've got things to do, you've got people to see, and it's not coming alive. Will you be comfortably uncomfortable? Not only that, you've got to invest time in rest so that you have energy, clarity, Focus. And there are going to be, again, all kinds of times when you're like, man, I got to. I got to do all this because if I don't do all this, then all these bad things are going to happen. And it's like, well, do I, do I trust him? And if I can't trust him enough to get rest, then maybe I'm not spending enough time with him to get to know him. Because, see, the Bible says he's all-powerful, all-knowing, and he's everywhere at one time. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning, and the end. He is the first and the last. He is the one who said, let there be light, and there was light. He is the creator of the world. And so I think he can handle your job and mine. I think he can handle your bank account and mine. And so if I can't trust him with those things, then it means I don't really know him yet. So I need to go back and invest some more time with him so that I can trust him, so that I can rest, so that I have the energy, the clarity, and the focus to live generously. And then the fourth habit is to live in community. In other words, don't do life alone. One is too small a number for greatness. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Let us... Think about each other. So one of the reasons we need to do life with other people is because, well, we're going to think about one another and help one another to show love to one another and do good deeds. He says you should not stay away from the church meetings as some are doing. Now, isn't it amazing? Things haven't changed in 2,000 years, have they? Right? I mean, it's interesting to me. Paul is thought to, by many scholars, to have written um, Hebrews. And so what does he say? He says, hey, we need to do life together. And he says, where is the place that God has created in which we can engage and begin this process? He says it's the local church. Worshiping together, whether it be the weekend or Wednesday or whether it be in a small group. He says, and don't stop doing that as people do. Why? Because the skin always pulls towards the ditch. The same reason that your kids and my kids, when given french fries, don't want to share them. Right? I just naturally, mine, even though I can buy plenty of french fries. And for the same reason, you and I 
struggle sometimes to be uncomfortable in the process of getting to know other people and engaging in the life of other people, even though it's those relationships that are gonna allow us to live the dream that's in our heart. He says, you should not stay away from the church meetings as some are doing, but you should meet together. Why? To encourage one another to do this even more as you see the day coming. In other words, we all need to do life together. And when I say come, you know, when it's talking about uh, not to uh, quit coming together or meeting together as believers, it doesn't mean just sitting in a chair. It means engaging. That's why living generously is important. Why? Because now you're serving. And who are you serving with? By yourself? No, you're serving with other people. And as a result, you're what? You're getting to know that person. They're getting to know you. They're encouraging you. You're encouraging them. They're challenging you. They're kicking the uh, Hebrews. And one of the translations says, spur one another on. To remind one another of our dream. To remind one another to live a disciplined life. But that means sometimes you have to be uncomfortable because walking up to people you don't know and introducing yourself. And then, ah, I better call them and see if they want to go have coffee. And then I'm going to have to open up to them if I really want to get to know them. I'm going to have to be vulnerable and they could hurt me. So that means, again, how all these build on one another. I better trust that what God's telling me to do is, 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 is right. I bet I need that rest so I can be focused and energized. And if I'm not a generous person, I'll never call you for coffee because I'm busy just like everybody else in this planet. I'll never make time to get to know one another. We'll be acquaintances. I will wave to one another, but we won't get to know one another. And if we don't get to know one another, we can't succeed at what's in your heart in 2019. Because I don't care how strong you are, I don't care how many muscles or money you have, you alone cannot succeed at what God has called and de the destiny that he's put inside of your heart. And so that means what? I gotta be uncomfortable. And I gotta introduce my, myself to somebody who may be one of three things. They may be awesome and be my future best friend or maybe even my future spouse or my future business partner, or my future employer. They may be mean and reject me. They may give me that look when I introduce myself. You ever get that look? Get away from me, yeah. <laughs> or they may be the weird one and I give them that look, right? All those things can happen. That's why it's uncomfortable. If you knew they were gonna be your best friend, it wouldn't be hard, it wouldn't be difficult. But as an adult, you've been, um, well, you've met some weird people before. You've also been rejected before. And so it's just easier to do life alone, isn't it? The few people you know, maybe. But that doesn't lead to success. We were made, we were created by God to, to do life in community. Look at Proverbs 17, 17. A friend is always loyal. And a brother is born to help in a time of need. And we all have times of need. Ecclesiastes 4, I love this one. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close to, uh, together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. And then the last habit. And this one was difficult for me because there's so many different texts that talk about this. And it is to choose, and it is a choice, a strong work ethic. To choose a strong work ethic. The scripture says, the wisdom writer in Ecclesiastes 9, 10, and again, I think this was in Timothy's mind when Paul said, listen, Timothy, you need to be an example in the way in which you live. He says, whatever you do, do what? Well, what does that mean? Do with excellence. Well, what is whatever? Well, it is parenting. It is taking out the trash, painting the house, starting the business, going on a date, planning a birthday party, in everything. Whatever you do, do it well. Well, why don't we do everything well? Well, we're tired. 
Well, why are we tired? Because we're not intimate enough with God to actually trust him with the things that keep us up at night or to trust him that in the future, through the uncomfortableness, we will have a job that we actually love to get up and go to. See how they all work together? And if we don't do things well, then we don't, again, we don't progress. Look what he says. Whatever you do, do well. For when you go to the grave, there will be no work or planning or knowledge or wisdom. In other words, time is short. We think we got lots of time sometimes, you know what I mean? I'll, I'll, I'll progress tomorrow, but today I'm just going to sleep in. I, this is one of the things my dad taught me. He taught me a strong work ethic. And I would, my dad was a like plumber, electrician, heating, air, all that kind of stuff. And I would work with him in the summer. And we would be like setting a, a toilet or something like that. And, you know, if I was going to be there for a while, what I would do is I would sit down like this to work. Right? I mean, I'm going to be here a while. I might as well be comfortable. You know, I got my screwdriver, my hammer, whatever, you know. I'm, and my dad would come up and said, what are you doing? I'm working. No, you're not working sitting like that. So you never sit down. And so my dad would always make me get up on my knees or get up like a catcher, you know. And, and, and so even today, if I'm trying to put something together that Stephanie goes out and buys. <sighs> Anyways, all right. <laughs> I have a love-hate relationship with Amazon, okay, but... I mean, I, 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 if I sit down, I feel, I feel guilty. The other thing is, you know, my dad, I was kind of a runner, really. And my dad said, go get one of those drop cords, you know, extension cords. And I'd just kind of walk and look around. Because I figured the longer it took me, the quicker we were to going home, you know. And my dad comes there and said, that's not the way you do that. I would do what? I'm carrying a drop cord. It's not the way you walk. And so my dad taught me, you know, how, how, to, how to walk. You know, how to get from one place to the other with a sense of purpose uh, in each and every step. He talked about outworking others, coming in early, leaving late. And then when I started playing basketball, my coaches reinforced this. Reinforced how important. I remember I had one coach and he talked about how we're going to play teams who are more talented than us. But if they don't reach their potential and we do, we will defeat them. Look what the scripture says in Proverbs 14, 25. It says, work brings profit, but mere talk leads to poverty. You know anybody that they're all talk? They never do anything. And not only do they all talk, I mean, they're not exercising, but they try to tell you how to exercise. You know that person, right? They're not on a diet, but they sit down at the lunch and try to tell you what you ought to be eating. Right? I mean, they've never started a business, but they're telling you how to start your business. Right? I mean, that, that's what that scripture's talking about. Work brings profit. And you know why I believe that? Because I've discovered that as well. When I began to do uh, athletics and play basketball, and I realized when all the time I was working, all the time I was practicing, see, I grew up in a rural town. So you didn't just go outside and play on the playground with a bunch of people. When I practiced basketball, I went out and I played myself. I won most of the time, but I, 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 played, I played myself and chewed and chewed in the winter and the summer. But then our basketball team began to win championships. I got a, a scholarship to go to college for free. I'd never been out of the country, and I got to go out of the country to, to play basketball and, and see the world. I realized that work brings profit, but work is uncomfortable. And work today doesn't necessarily bring profit today. Work today brings profit tomorrow. And so the question is, are you willing to remain under? Are you and I willing to be uncomfortable? Proverbs chapter 22, verse 29 says, Observe people who are good at their work. Skilled workers are always in demand and admired. They don't take a back seat to anyone. Proverbs 13, 4 says, Lazy people want much but get little. But those who work hard will prosper. Acts chapter 20, verse 35 tells us, and I have, this is Paul. And Paul was an evangelist. But he also, every town he went in to do a, like a, a revival, a teaching uh, series, or he would uh, earn his money by being a tent maker. He worked with his hands. He never wanted to take money. Look what he says. He says, and I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You remember the words of the Lord Jesus, more blessed to give than to receive. In other words, part of our work ethic is so that we can help those around us. Whether it be our family, whether it be our friends, or whether it be those that we come into contact with. 
And then 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. In other words, when you this afternoon or Monday, you get up and you go to work and you work harder than anybody there, you get there on time. You're not hiding behind the boxes, hoping that the supervisor doesn't see you, right? I mean, you're giving it everything you've got and they're like, why are you doing that? This is just a, a beginning job. We're just getting paid so much an hour because I'm not working for my employer. I'm working for the glory of God. I, I want, and, and that's, I think, you think about how do we impact the world? What if we just had the best work ethic? What if they said, whether they were believers or not, said, you know, if you want to get things done, you just need to hire some of those Christ followers. Because they'll work like there's no tomorrow. Why? Because they're not doing it for you. They may not even like you. But they're doing it for the glory of God. See, you can't do that unless you trust him. Right? You'll get caught up in the fact that your supervisor's an idiot. And you're like, well, they don't deserve it. This company hasn't treated me right. They don't deserve it. And you'll have every reason in the world to go through the motions at work. It's not a job you like. It doesn't seem to make making progress. But if you've been hanging and spending time with God, investing time with God, then you're intimate with God. And you know that God created you on purpose to do something of significance. And that that significance is on the other side of the pain that you are presently experiencing. And so you are comfortable, maybe not enjoying, but you are comfortable in this uncomfortableness because you know where it's taking you. That's why James said, count it all joy, brothers, when you face trials and difficulties and struggles. Because you know where it's taking you you know what's on the other side. And like I said at the very beginning, that's my heart's desire for you and for me. But I also know the truth that if I'm not diligent in my own life, I'll be the same next year. Because I like comfort. I like a comfortable bed, chair, comfortable shoes. I like comfort. And if I'm not careful, my, my direction, my shift will always be to shift towards comfort instead of towards discipline and self-control. Would you bow your head? With your heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, thank you for these incredible folks. There's not a one of us that are here by accident. We're all here because you've created us to do something that matters, something of value, importance. And while the enemy wants to tear down, to destroy, to kill, to steal, help us to be self-disciplined. Help us to invest time with you, invest time in our rest, to live generously, live in community and choose to have an incredible work ethic for your glory in Jesus name. Amen.